Right, I'm Will Hossack, I'm Director of Teaching at uh, Physics and Astronomy. Uh, firstly, you'll notice I, it says Physics Education Research, so I'm a bit of a fraud. I'm not actually on the Physics Education Research Group. We've got a small Physics Education Research Group inside the school. Unfortunately, Ross, who is, the, who is one of our Teaching Development Officers, is in Canada on holiday, so I've been delegated. Uh, so I am. So I'm actually got a traditional physics background, as as, as we mentioned. What I'm actually are, I'm a laser holography, optical imaging person, uh, mainly an experimentalist. Teached absolutely conventionally for twenty odd years. Wasn't chalk and chat. I was PowerPoint and overhead. Uh, and about two years ago, with the school went on and under number of people, we took our big Physics 1A course. I'll explain a little bit about that. It is a very large first year class. It takes all the physics students, it takes all, all but it's also an optional course for chemists, engineers, uh, mathematicians, informatics. So it runs about 300 to 330 students. So it's a Scottish first year. So what it covers is it's almost A level. Because in Scotland, remember, we have effectively got a year extra. I mean, so in other words, we would have a four years to a BSc, five years to an MPhys. So we've effectively got an extra year on the front. What we do is about 80% of our intake comes in this first year. 20% of our intake, i.e. the students who are coming in with A stars, they can actually miss and come direct in to our second year. We call that fast track. So what we do is we offer two routes into the program. So we offer routes for the majority of the students who come in and do a four year, four year to BSc, five year to MPhys. However, we get basically students with either very good A levels or very good advanced higher, which is the sort of Scottish equivalent. And they can see a program which is three years to BSc, four years to MPhys. In other words, exactly like where our main competitors are. So, so this course is the first year to the longer degree program, i.e. this is the real first year course. So what it covers is basically what's in A level, but a rather more formal way. I mean, one of the ones we, one, one of the ones we have, a large, these large numbers of students, they've all done either Scottish higher well, they've all done Scottish higher. If they're from Scotland, they've all done Scottish higher. Many of them have done advanced higher, which is the second one. The other problem we have in Scotland is that many students, their university entry is based on their hire, and they know they've got a place. They've got six A's at hire, not uncommon. And of course, they know they're sitting on an, they're sitting on an unconditional offer for us, they're in their final year at school, they get an unconditional offer for us, and they feel the need to party and go mountain biking. Uh, at which point the, a the advanced hire gets dropped somewhere, it, it get, gets dropped somewhere, um, somewhere in the mass. Also, we have students from England, again, who have got very good, very, very, very good entry grades, and the really top ones will go in to our, will go in to our fast track, and these are the students who are typically, you know, A, three A's, physics, maths, further maths, all at A star. And we get a reasonably large number of these. Now, clearly, they are, they are going to go in to the fast track program, which is, again, they're basically the direct competitor to our other main English universities. So what this course aims to do is to, carry, is, is to actually cover material which is reasonably well established, i.e. it is relatively simple mechanics, so it's things that they have seen before in A-levels, hires, except at a rather more formal level. Now, we always had a bit of a problem with this course, was they, they came, they were good students, maybe not the absolute top, but they were pretty good, and they saw we were teaching them about trolleys rolling down slopes. We were teaching them about yo-yos, we were teaching them about cars braking, and they said, oh, we've seen that before, we'll go and party. And they did. And they went and partied, became a bit disengaged, and suddenly you had students who were arriving with us with A's in high, A's and A level, and were failing these courses, which just doesn't make any sense. 
And the problem was there was a bit of disengagement. So this was, and this was the background as to why we started looking this way. And this course had been developed for a number of years. And about two years ago, Simon Bates, who was then director of teaching in the school, and also the person who set up the physics education group, along with Ross Galloway, Ross is a teaching development officer in the school, decided to do the Eric Mazur or what Gibbs' method and turn the classroom upside down. So they did, they, they did that and I was director of teaching at the time and said, sounds a bit adventurous, get on with it, I don't want to know. And it worked beautifully. What then happened was Simon has gone out, he's now got the chair of science education at University of British Columbia uh, and Ross who is going to continue to run it, but Ross is actually visiting Simon at University of British Columbia at the moment. So what happened was when we ran it the second year, I decided that I would join the course and as, as a lecturer on the course, and I'd roped in another colleague of mine, again, who's got a very, very conventional science background, and we basically had a go at it. So that's the background of the course that we operate on. Uh, it's known as Physics 1A, uh, and again, these are the comments. So it's got the Ross is the course organizer. I'm one of the lecturers. John, other lecturer. We've also got a series of workshops because the way we run the course, it's three lectures a week plus one three hour workshop per week. And again, I'll talk a little bit about workshops, but I'll see how my time goes. Uh, workshops run with a single head of class. So we take this group of 300 odd and we break them into five afternoons. So we don't have tutorials, we have a room like this, but a bit bigger. And each table is a tutorial group. And what we then have is our head of class, who is usually a senior academic. In fact, one of my heads of class, one of our heads of class, is my head of school. And they are actually the academic lead, and then we have one PhD student per 10 students. So we would typically have, so if we've got 50 or say 60, I think, which fits it in the room, we'd have a head of class, six PhD students. So that's the way we run tutorials. So again, no, no small work group tutorials. That we discovered was a route where, I mean, you all see, you've all seen it. You've all done the, all done the tutorial where you, where you get five students in your office and they desperately try and examine their, toe, their shoelaces for an, entire, for an entire hour and try to avoid your gaze. So again, that was a way we, we, we binned workshop, we binned tutorials in the whole of pre-honours teaching about four or five years ago now, and I've gone to this idea of doing everything in big workshops. And that works as well. Again, that's maybe more on the roundtable discussion. We also then have secretaries and technicians to actually help us with the course. So, what I'm going to do is motivation. Why we did it, so I think I've done a little bit of that already, what we did, what happened, and what we're then going to do is we're actually going to do exactly what I would do in one of the, one of the lectures. So that's why you've got clickers going, going around, and I've got a couple of little questions, one which is a little bit physics-y, one which is a little bit controversial. So we'll actually tie and emulate exactly what, we, what I actually do in, the, in, say, in the lectures. So, where does it come from? Again, the idea I think originally ended up from Eric Mazur, and those of you who, is, is it a name familiar to you? One or two of you? You know, Eric, Eric Mazur is a very well-known physicist in Harvard. He runs the Mazur Group. He's one of the main drivers. He's an atomic, he's an atomic physicist. Um, got a world-class reputation in physics. He was also teaching, he had a similar problem about maybe 15 years ago. He was teaching physics for, physics for uh, medics. And in America, and particularly in Harvard, all medical students have got to do a formal analytical physics course, i.e. a physics course using calculus. Now, there's certain things medics hate. Mathematics, physics and anything that isn't directly related to medicine. And he had absolutely exactly the same. He had an incredibly bright, very, very active 
group who absolutely hated what he was doing. He would come into the lecture theatre and they would all groan and he got lack of attendance and real problems. And a number of years ago, he went out and decided to come up with this method of trying to turn the classroom on its head. And he's written this book. And again, I'm also, if you simply, if those of you who haven't seen it, if you simply Google him, you will find the talk on YouTube. Uh, he's booked up several years in advance, actually. So if you want him to, if you want to come in, if you want him to come and visit and do his inspirational talk, uh, you have to join a very, very long queue. Um, really nice chap. What happened was we managed to get him to actually come and do um, uh, a keynote speech in, in Edinburgh and under our Institute for Academic Development. And a group of us, including Simon and Eric, and they all landed in the pub afterwards, uh, as one does. Uh, and they decided, OK, your physics first year is very similar to the position I was in. Why not try it? And they did. So again, that's some of the background as to where this came from. So what's the me methodology? The whole idea is the traditional classroom, if you think of it, what we actually do is you go there and you put lecture notes up. You actually have a PowerPoint presentation. More traditional of you, use the blackboard. And you sit and you give the students the information. So you actually give them the material that they need i.e. in physics you do the equations, you work through the problems, you tell them about um, momentum, you tell them about energy, you tell them about angular momentum. And you do that in lectures. What you then do is you set a whole series of tutorial questions and a whole series of reading and you tell them, go away and do it. And that's that bit. So the analysing as to working out why why you use vectors, what momentum is, that we're expecting the students to do in their own time. Right? We're, so what we're giving, so that's the traditional way. I mean, that's the way, I mean, I teach, not only do I teach this course, I teach the, the dreaded course at first at physics undergraduate level. It's called the electromagnetism. And those of you who, right, it's usually the complete horror course, but there we do it the other way around. I actually do it this way. I teach them all about Lenz's law, Faraday's law, all that sort of stuff, conventional lectures, and I set all the, all, all, all the exam questions. Completely traditional. So that's what we normally do. So what this is aiming to do is actually take this, oops, uh, I got that wrong. Mm. Right. So, vertical classroom. The whole idea is to move the information transfer out of the classroom. To say, in the classroom time, we're going to do something else. We're going to actually interact with the students. We're going to ask them questions. We're going to challenge them in the lecture theatre. And we're going to, therefore, so we're going to get the information to them another way. And we're going to, in other words, we're going to get them to do that themselves. So we're going, we are going to use their study time to actually do the course material. And then in the lecture, we're going to devote, devote that to the analysing, thinking, discussing. So that's the idea of flipping the classroom. Now I see one or two puzzled faces here when I said, remember, there's 300 of them. <coughs> so that's a bit of a challenge. So that's what we try to do. So that's what this method aims to do, is to actually take that conventional classroom and do that to it. To have the private study doing the understanding and remembering. In other words, the private study working through the core material of the course. And in the lectures, we do the applying, analysing, evaluating, creating, i.e. discussing. So we've got to somehow make that work in a group, in a large open lecture theatre with one person at the front. So that's what we try to do. Now initially, I must admit, when I saw this, I went to Eric Mazur's lecture and I thought, yeah, hmm, yes, works with American students. American students are very chatty. It's not going to work. Um, or it works with that group of students. No, it's not going to work with that group of students. All exactly the things that all, my, that all my colleagues all said. But we had a go at it and it does actually work. So what did we actually do? So we started off in 
one week, you set a set of guided reading. So you set a chapter, so we've got a set of course notes, we have it linked to a textbook. Right? We use the absolutely conventional textbook. For those of you who have got physics background, it's Resnick, Halliday and Walker. It's the telephone directory. It's the absolutely standard, big American textbook. Imagine every subject has got one. Right? So there's 1,500 pages of beautifully illustrated, beautifully drawn pictures on physics. So what we do, what we do is we set personal reading. We expect students to buy this book. It's the only book we expect them to buy in first year. It's about 40 pounds. So it's not a huge investment. It also comes with a CD. It also comes with a course with a book website, which is run by the company. So a huge amount of information on board. So we set personal reading tests. And then each week, we set a quiz. And it's an online quiz. We use, we use um, Blackboard Learn system, which is as our, our VLE. And you set a quiz. And that forces them to look online quiz. What they then do is they fill in the quiz. And on it, there's one question, which is, what didn't you understand? There's, about f there's five multiple choice questions to test that they've actually done it. And then there's a free text question. It said, and which bits would you like us to do in lectures? And that quiz closes on a Sunday at, at 8 o'clock at night. So what we can therefore do is go in and analyze and what happens on the quiz. So what we then use is in week N, we do peer instruction lectures. So peer instruction lectures are, again, as we'll see later, contain no content. They're just questions and discussions, right? which is what we'll talk about later. We then go on and do week N plus one workshops. So after they have done personal reading, they've done peer instruction lectures, they then have workshops the following week, all timed. So in other words, they carry on with that work. So they've got a three-hour workshop where they can work through problems, questions, talk to tutors, talk to class leader. We then do a hand-in assignment. So each week, they've got a small hand-in assignment. Again, typically two, sometimes three, short, five-mark questions. Right. So that gets handed in. Oops, I've overshot one. Right. So they also get feedback here. Right. So that's the way we operate it. So run it over a three-week cycle. So they do the pre-reading, instructional lectures, workshops. Right. So that's the plan. So what do you need? What resources have we got? We have a course handbook, which are detailed notes and examples. Now, this has been built up over several years. What it actually is, there's the standard big textbook, which is Resnick, Halliday, and Walker. I've got all about, and what we've done is we've picked out the important sections of it. And again, I've got a copy of that on my laptop. It runs to about 140 pages. And it contains the core material. It contains questions, worked examples. Everything goes up front. All the workshop questions are given out in one big book. So they've got this book with them right through the whole course. Also, they can take this book into the exam. So they take this book to the lectures, to the workshops, to everything. They can annotate it. They can write on it anything they want. That's their resource. And they can then they take that into the exam with them as background to the course. Right. We have an online site with self-diagnostic questions. Again, this has been built up over a large number of years. Again, I've got a copy of this on my laptop. Uh, we've got a database system, which we've developed in-house at Edinburgh. Uh, we've got a couple of computing officers who put it together for us. Uh, and it allows you to store the course notes, all the MC, all the multiple choice questions, etc., all in one database. And it generates a 
XML. In fact, it generates an XML website is what it does. And it gives the students, again, that that's linked. And this has been built up over half a dozen years, at least. So there's this large amount of background material on. There is the textbook, which Resnick, Halliday, and Walker, not the most adventurous one. I know I have a copy of it, signed 1976. Uh, clearly, I did a physics degree. Uh, and I think almost everybody who's ever done a physics degree over that era has got a copy, has got a moth-eaten, dog-eared copy of this book, and it has basically developed. And it's the, one of the absolute standard. There's about four absolutely standard textbooks in this area, and that's the one we've chosen. We developed weekly quizzes, which are all in the VLE, and again, that's used as this that's used uses feedback. We've got these li li lecture clicker questions, and again, that's what we're going to explore in a few minutes' time. We've got workshop questions and solutions. Again, they're all linked. They're already in the book, so they get these up front, and then the question and the solutions are released the week after. Uh, and the most important thing you need to do something like this is you need an active course organizer who runs around and keeps everybody else in track. Uh, and that's what Ross is particularly good at. So you need somebody who's really on top of things, both technically, in order to be able to run all this bit at the front, and actually does, making sure everything ticks over. We also would have a, we also would have a administrator in the school office who deals with the hand-ins, etc., as well. So that's the sort of resources that we have, have for it. I think this all needs to be in place. When they say just-in-time teaching, I think the just-in-time bit is going to be this bit. But I think for this to work, the rest has got to be pretty well in place. So I think before you can actually go down that model. So, what happened? Summary, students mostly did the reading, students mostly did the quizzes, most students mostly came to lectures. We have some evidence, because one of the other ones we're doing in Edinburgh is we've got this physics education group who are actually taking this data and are actually using it for, physics, for science education research. So they're actually monitoring this, these courses, monitoring what happens, and therefore allowing us to compare to what's happening in equivalent courses in other universities around the world. This isn't my work. This is entirely what physics education do. Quiz participation. This was for the 11-12, the reading quizzes, and that was the percentage completing the quizzes. So we're up at, ooh, best part of 90%. Because the quizzes are easy. They go online at, I think they'll go online at Wednesday, 12 o'clock, and they close at the, they, they close about 8 o'clock on the Sunday evening. Uh, what you find, it's so quite an interesting monitoring, you, uh, you end up nothing, 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 huge great spike on Sunday afternoon. I thought students did other things on Sunday afternoons, um, but apparently not. They are willing to do this. And the way we get them to do this, there's a little bit of bribery and corruption here. We do allocate a small amount of marks to the course. There's one thing that motivates students, and it's marks. And even a little mark. So we actually allocate 5% of the assessment of the course to the weekly quizzes. Now, if you actually calculate what is the effect on one quiz, it's absolutely negligible, but it's enough to give them just a little bit of nudge. So we end up that works quite well. And means of the quiz, you see that most of them get it right. I, we do actually make the quizzes really quite straightforward. So the green line is the number of quizzes. We have 10, week, 10 quizzes, we have 11 a week semester. So we typically find that the mean quiz marks were about, you know, they were getting about 75-80%. Uh, okay, we've got the two means and standard deviations. This is a more sophisticated graph than I would have done. But we see they basically do the quizzes, they basically get it right. And again, the one, it's a small enough fraction, because again, clearly the other one you have to worry about when you have an online quiz, was it the student who did it? And did they all do it in collusion? What we are we're hoping on this is that the percentage, the weight of the course, is small enough. Do we really care? If they all sit in a group round a table, 
in the union bar with our laptops at, on, on the, uh, at, six, uh, at seven o'clock on the Sunday evening and they all give you the right answers, fine, because hopefully they've all learned something. So as long as the actual amount is small enough, that I don't think is a problem. Again, this was one of the absolutely standard ones that all my colleagues said, oh, they'll all cheat. They'll all get together on a Sunday evening and they'll all do the quiz. And I said, fabulous. It's exactly what we want them to do. Uh, and seems to work. What we then do is we take question six and we stick it in Wordle. So we word cloud it. So the idea is the first lecture on the Monday, when they come in, the first thing we put up and said, you did the quiz, which tells them that we saw you did the quiz. Now clearly we did, can't do much analyzing it, but you can cut and paste the final question and within 15 seconds you can cut and paste it into Wordle and make a word cloud. Uh, and I think you can fairly obviously see that we're having a bit of trouble with vectors. And so you do that as the motivation. You, you could go in and say, we could predict this. But it gives a bit of motivation to, 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 that, to, to the students to say that we actually did it. We looked at what you did, and this is what we're going to do. Uh, that's one of Ross's. I think you might see, that's one of mine. You can see, there were, I think you might guess what the topic was. So we do that first thing again. It's what? Three minutes to cut and paste into Wordle, stick it onto the stick it on to, onto the VLE, use it as the first opening slide to lectures. And that hopefully gets a bit of motivation. This is the most interesting graph. Did they come to lectures? One of the problems, I don't know how many of you have a do you take attendance at lectures? We don't. We tried, and what we discovered is the first time we, with our students maybe are less cooperative. Because what happens is the first time you take attendance, they accept it. The second time you take attendance, they accept it. The third time you take attendance, no matter what you do, you get Albert Einstein's and Donald Duck start appearing. <laughs> and by the fourth time in lecture, they have rebelled on you and they're not filling in the form. We did actually have a scan-in system one time where they would all come in and they'd scan in the lectures and we have a double door to lecture theatres. And I remember being at the front of a lecture theatre and I heard the outer door open and I heard beep, 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 beep and the inner door didn't open. <laughs> uh, they had sent one student out of the flat to sign in. <laughs> and it was rife. We have no control over our students at all regarding attendance. We just, it's just a losing battle. However, what we can do is we can monitor it with clickers. We don't assign clickers. We could if we really bothered to actually do attendance with clickers. We don't. But that's actually the number of students who responded to clicker questions throughout the semester. And you can see about 80 we reckon that about 80% of the students who are in lecture theatre will actually click. And I don't see the characteristic negative exponential. You know how you normally see you start off, you know, they're all keen to start with, there's this wonderful exponential decay, you send them an email saying, why aren't you attending, you're all going to fail, it jumps up again, tails off, you send them another email, jumps up again, tails off. You know, we've all done it, we're not seeing it. They are actually turning up. And remember, this is Edinburgh, this is decent weather, this is decent weather, this is snowing, this is heading to Christmas, this is foul. And this is when they're revising for their other exams. So we're still getting at week eight and nine, you're going into a lecture theatre where there's meant to be 300 of them and you're getting 280 of them. And we've never seen that. So that is working. And that's one of the, I think that's one of the biggest successes. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a little play. So I need to sit down to make this work. What we need to do is, if you could switch on your clicker, right, so that's the bottom button, and it will, so if you switch it on, it should be flashing with the two little arrows, 
type in 23, which is the join code. So 23. And it should now go with a tick. And you should now get in the little box that's got the two little arrows on it, you should have a heartbeat. All right. So, see, it's always useful to know students have heartbeats. So we've got 30 of you so far. Anybody struggling to get in? They're all working. So you should be having your clicker. It should have a single green flashing light with, about, with a flash about every half second. Right. So we should have 30 of you actually connected up to the system. So what we're going to do uh, we're going to go a little physicsy question, maybe ho hopefully not too physicsy, but I want to talk about this one. Right. We have got a disk rolling along the surface. Right. It's going round angular frequency omega. It's got radial distance r. Right. What's the speed at that point? So what you do is you vote. So one, two, three, sorry, I think it one, two, three, or A, B, C on these. And if you vote now, so I'll give you two minutes to vote. So don't discuss it to start with, just vote on your own. If you make a mistake, you can go back and change it. So you continue just to vote first. And I should see. Right, so starting now. Uh, right. We'll see there's some dispute. Chat about it. If you don't know physics, find a... How many people have got physics background, or claim to have a physics background? A few of you. Good. Go on. If you've got the wrong table without a physicist, go find a physicist. You have two minutes. So, let's see what's happened. Ah. <laughs> Not worked as well this time. <laughs> the answer's B. <laughs> Arguments, so what the, the argument, okay, the physics argument is the center there is moving at velocity V, therefore the one is moving at 2 V. Maybe it's the wrong audience. But what we do, <laughs> we'll show what really happens. <laughs> but what normally, the, the experimental one is that if you have about a third of your audience getting it right, and there's a big enough class, hopefully wisdom of crowds works. So let's try another one, which is a little, this one I thought was maybe a little bit too physics-y, but let's try, uh, let's try another one. Again, this is more a thinking one. Right. No, you see, the whole idea of the embarrassment is you don't know who's got it wrong. Think of it. <laughs> right. So you know yourselves. But here's another absolutely physics puzzle. Exactly the same thing. I've got a piece of metal. I cut a disc out. Right? So, in other words, the disc initially just fits the hole. Right? I now take the disc and I heat up the metal plate. Right? I then take this disc, which is still cold, and try and put it back through the hole, which is now in the hot plate. Right? So, we're not clicking yet, so we're still thinking about it. So there's three possible options, i.e. one, my cold disk just fits through the hole. That's one option. My doesn't fit through the hole, easily fits through the hole. 
So, let's play again. So, again, lots of dispute. Right? So, have a chat, have a think. And let's see what we thought this time. Has it changed? No, I don't think anybody's changed, have they? Uh, I think there's something wrong. No. It has changed round. It's changed round. So B, what this is, the software is a little bit uncontrollable. So you've now, mm, yes. Well, let's go back. So what we now do is we would go and look and see. Uh, one. Right. So what we would typically do now is go and actually close that down. Close that out of the way. Is I would have on the visualizer, so when we did a set of questions like that, I would actually go through on the visualizer, so given we hadn't live, I would then work through it. So my first one, again, I would start off with this typical you know, point there, zero, angular velocity, omega, therefore that one's going at r, that one's going at 2r. I would then go on and do something more advanced and actually look at it in terms of things like frames of reference, and again, a bit beyond what we would do with this, this audience, but then I could then go in, go forward and say, let's take this a bit further and maybe do a little bit of teaching, but on the hoof, depending on how the students went. So on this one, I could then go introduce the idea of vectors, vector notation, the idea of reference frames, changing reference frames, sort of on the hoof. Interestingly, the reason I put that question up, I thought it would be totally trivial for a group of physicists who've done A-level the idea that you've got something rolling along, the cent velocity of the center is going at v, and the velocity of going at the top is 2v. I immediately thought, when I set this question up, I assumed that was going to be completely trivial, and that was going to be the warm-up question for the day, just to get them, make sure all the clickers were connected. It took me 40 minutes to disentangle that in a lecture. It was a complete mess. I have the students climbing over the desk, arguing with me. Stand, this is an electric theater of 300. When I put the solution up and told them the top was going at 2V, I nearly had a riot on my hands. I had them saying, it's wrong, it can't be, it's got to be V, it's absolute rubbish, you're not, you know, mumble, 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 all over the place. It took me 40 minutes ad hoc in the lecture theater to straighten that one out. And they were comp what I discovered was that we'd been teaching them, again, those of you who have got the idea of physics have got the ideas of centers of mass, reference frames, moving reference frames. We'd done all this. But when I tested them in this question, I suddenly triggered in the whole class, they hadn't the faintest idea of what we'd been talking about. We had, they were completely and utterly confused with the idea of the stationary reference frame, the moving reference frame, was a complete and utter mystery. And the more I dug, the deeper the water I got into. So what was meant to have been a five minute, just make sure your clickers are going question, because I was go what I was actually going to be doing was cylinders rolling down hills, a moment of inertia. That was what was planned for lecture. That lecture went completely out the window. And that's the just in time bit. I spent, as I say, nearly 40 minutes disentangling that. And I even managed, on hoof, I managed to find YouTube videos on that subject in the middle of the lecture. So that's the just-in-time bit. So that's why I put that one up. So your other question, which is always the good fun one, the way you think about it, Again, this caused huge controversy. This wasn't one of mine. This was done in the early bit of the class. The argument is, again, you can start exploring, because the argument is, you consider a thin min of ring of metal just round the inside of the loop. So you consider a radius, so you've got your disk, the hole cut in it, radius r, thickness delta r, so you've got this thin loop of metal, and therefore you can take that out and consider that to be a band. Right? So when you heat up a band, it expands. Therefore, when you, so you heat up the plate, the band must expand. 
right? So if the band expands, the radius goes from r to r dash, r dash is bigger than r, i.e. the hole gets bigger, so the cold disk drops straight to the middle of the hole. Right? So that's the same trick as you use cartwheels. If you want to put a tire on a cartwheel, you heat up the tire, put it over the piece of metal, over, over the piece of wood, and cool down the tire cartwheel, and it compresses it. But a question like that, we can then on the hoof start to say, okay, it was a question, a bit of a trick question we got in, but we got, use that I would use that as a tool in physics. Those of you who have taught things like moment of inertia. One of the standard tricks in physics is to take an object like that and break it up into a whole series of bands and sum them all up. And then link that to, 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 link that to calculus, link that to integration. So once you've done a question like that, you can go in and go on and start exploring on the hoof, depending if your audience are with you, how you're going to use that in terms of the idea of an surface integrals, line integrals. So it's a sort of key in. And that's the bit that we would do on the hoof in the lecture. So the general, what we find with this, let me get back to my, what meant to happen is you have a question like that. This was real data taken from the class. When they did it the first time, they got that. So they had about 30% getting it right. The other two vastly confused. <laughs> You do the second one, dun, 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 they've learned. And you can monitor it. So you can do this talking, and experimentally what we find is that about, if about a third of the class have got the question right the first time, then what happens is that when they actually go and put it together and all talk, then almost always it'll go to the right point. However, if it doesn't, what you then do is you then teach it. So if they've all got, so if 83% of the class have got the question right, you can see, tick, done that bit. If not, you've got to have a little bit of background. Yeah, I, what I do is I have some pre-prepared scribbles for the visualizer. Ross does it live, it depends on your style. But that's the way we run the whole course. So a lecture consists of maybe six, eight of such questions, plus demos. So that's all. So does it work? We hope so. There's a thing in physics called the first concept analysis test. Uh, first concepts analysis test is where it covers this exactly this sort of material. It's an online test. That was before and you have a fairly mixed ability, it tests out 30. You've got some students totally acing it at the top end when they arrive. Some students, well, we assume the students are, I'm hoping their internet connection broke <laughs> down this end, but we've got a pretty broad spectrum. So we go through and we actually teach them that material, and it works. It goes whoo. So we retest them again at the end, and we're getting an improvement. Again, you can calculate the improvement, and you can go up and look at what is the, what is the normalized gain. Again, this is where the physics education people go in. And 0.52 doesn't quite get us to Harvard, but gets us to Princeton. Right? Doesn't quite, this is, this is published in many of the American universities. But 0.52 is getting up as, about, now our previous to that, our normals teaching was rather less than that. And, I mean, again, we do it in two classes. Again, we got this, this uh, diagnostic gains. And forget about these. This is, a diff this is the average. Uh, this is the, 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 the average gain. Not quite sure where that comes from. This isn't one of my slides. But this 0.52 gain showing that we are actually, it's working. The students are engaged. If you measure this diagnostic test before and after, that is equivalent results that you would get from the top international universities around the world. And it has gone up. When we did this with the previous, we were about 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.48, 0 0.49. So it's gone up a bit. So we definitely haven't broken it. Um, and so scores. Again, examination scores. External examiner, her team course should be congratulated. This is a challenging paper with very strong emphasis on problem solving. So in other words, we haven't done down the exam. 
And again, we're very happy. It's a course where we've got pass rates in the, well, okay, we have 40% pass rates. We typically have pass, pass rates in the 80s on this course. Um, so we then surveyed the students. What do you like? Do you like? To that was the result we got. So we asked them basically a set of questions. Again, we used, I think we used clickers for this one actually. And what we had was we had a small number of students, strongly like the traditional approach. Small number of students. If it isn't done on the blackboard in chalk, it's not done. And that is, that I don't think you will ever fix. Um, again, slightly traditional approach, but they liked it. And they liked it because they came to lectures. And they kept involved. What did they say? Oops, the students thought. Again, we really like the way we prepare for lectures. I'll fix it, we'll put them all up. Right. Uh, quite long, thoughtful discussions come back from the students. Some didn't like the idea that, they, that they, they thought it was going too slowly. Some thought that some were there very much to learn, you know, they absolutely wanted to get the maximum material. But the greatest majority, no, it was much more interactive, which helped further our understanding of the material. Strongly believe we can learn more from doing this than, rather than listening. And we got many, many dozens of responses like that from students. And there were really, some of them were great big, long, very thoughtful analysis. So we were really quite pleased with that. So what do you need for lectures if you actually want to do this? Well, what you need is the word cloud. Well, that's easy. If you collect the questions from the end, no real problem. You need clicker questions. You need somewhere between five and eight. The most I ever used was six. But you would typically go into the lecture with maybe eight questions ready. I never got there. You need a summary of the solutions on paper for the visualizer. You need some demos. I mean, typically, this is a first year physics class. I teach the bit on angular momentum, you know, the bit where you spin round. And of course, you have to have mutual, mutual ritual humiliation of the lecturer by having them spun in an office chair with weights out. I mean, they expect that. So they expect, that they expect this sort of thing and being fired across the lecture theatre on a trolley powered by fire extinguishers. I mean, it's the sort of things that first year physics lecturers are meant to do. Uh, so we do exactly that sort of thing. But the important one is no notes, no slides, no PowerPoint. So it's slightly interesting walking into a lecture theatre with 300 students, six clicker questions, no PowerPoint, no backup. Bit entertaining to start with. So, personal reflections. Again, clearly, I had for 20 odd years gone in there with the full PowerPoint, you know, the, the plan of the lecture. You know, I, it was going to take me six minutes to, it was going to take me six minutes to introduce Gauss's law. It was going to take me so many minutes to introduce you know, that integral, that integral, and you had it all timed out. At, out the window, completely. Sometimes I had gone through my clicker questions and I was improvising on the demo to fill in the last 10 minutes. Other times I was 40 minutes in and I hadn't finished my first clicker question. So you've got to be completely prepared to throw timing out the window and say, okay, this lecture, I didn't get anywhere near as far as I did want. I'll have to modify what I do in the next lecture. So that's something, the whole idea of how, how normally you go in and you've got 50 minutes and you expect to do that bit of material, 50 minutes, not this way. And that's where the just-in-time bit comes in. Again, forget about carefully planned. Uh, I tell you, 50 minutes lectures rush by. You go in there and most times you're in there, you're into this, you have the students chatting, you have them climbing over the desks. I'll tell you the hardest bit this room isn't big enough to quite get it, but the hardest bit is actually calming them down again. Remember, it's like a primary school out there, that if you have 300 of them all discussing a physics question, they're climbing over the desks to chat to each other. It's actually getting them all seated down again and all getting them calmed down and pointed the right direction. That's what takes, that's actually the hardest bit. 
again, great classroom atmosphere, very informal. They will come up and chat to you in the middle of the lecture. I've had students in the middle of a lecture theatre of 300 raising their hands for the first time ever. At the end of the lecture, you're trying to get out of the lecture because there's just a great gaddle of students around you. And first year lecturers are calling you by their first name. Now, that's not usual. Uh, freedom away from coverage, it's all in the notes, focus on what matters, and again, you often find very unexpected results. Things that you just assumed, oh, well, they know that, that's trivial. When you actually go in and diagnose it in the lecture theatre, you realise, no, it isn't, isn't. We have another one which I didn't do because it's a bit harder to do with friction. Again, part of the whole series of quicker questions about robots dragging boxes across floors. And it was a complete disaster. It took me an entire lecture to disentangle that one as well. And again, things that we thought they knew, you suddenly discover that they don't. So that's a quite interesting bit. So how do we test it? I know I'm conscious of time. Small weight for weekly assessment. Peerwise participation, again, again, this is a, a self-teaching. I think this will be picked up in another one. Weekly workshop questions, 20%. Exam, open course notes, 70%, 40% pass criteria. Nothing too unconventional there, except we put a small weight to the weekly questions, which gets them to actually do them. Well received by students, what the school reflection, again, clearly we are a very large, very traditional physics department. Uh, we have many staff, when we mentioned the idea, went a very funny colour, and bid, yes, but where's the blackboards? Uh, well received by students, good feedback. Open notes was the only bit, as director of teaching, I got a bit of stick about for my other members of staff. But it works. You have to design the question. You can no longer ask the question, write down Newton's laws of motion, because it's in the notes. You've got to ask them a problem. So you're testing something different. Again, one of the most popular courses in the college, 300 plus in students from all, from all areas. We have to cap the number of students who come to the course simply because we don't have a big enough lecture theatre. So we're pretty happy it's working. So what are we doing? Physics 1A is fully implemented. Physics 1B, which is the follow-on course, we're most of the way there. Uh, we're doing the clickers, but we're not doing the full um, week, week, weekly tests. Pre-honours astronomy, I've got uh, Catherine, who's uh, one of the young female lecturers who's mad keen on the idea, and she's just going to do it next year. Um, School of Maths, not where you would expect have done it, except what they've done it based on a, they have done it based on a textbook. So they don't have the course notes, and so Toby Bailey, my opposite number in the School of Maths, is doing it. I think they're struggling a little bit at the moment because I think they've got it too high a level. I think they're you because what they have, they're just using a textbook rather than synthesizing from a textbook. Again, implement open questions, implementation costs. It's high in the first year because it's got to be in place. You've got to have the notes, the clicker questions, everything in place when it's running. So I think there's a big overhead the first year. I came in on the second year. So I already came in with a whole load of stuff inherited. So all I had to do was to add the odd few clicker questions. But once you've done that, I think it's quite stable. Uh, works well for subjects where the students have seen it before and have time to read ahead. It's working well in physics where, again, the group of students should know this material, maybe in a less formal way, but they should basically know it. So there's a degree of revision. I don't know whether this would work for senior courses. I, for many years, I have taught a final year lasers course at quite a high level, at a MSc level. Uh, I may try it, it will be interesting. There I've got a small group of 30 students, and they're pulling together, and again, a fairly advanced mathematical course. Again, haven't gone there yet. You'll always get the students say, we paid 9K to be taught, not to teach ourselves, you ignore them. Most of that does actually calm down and they realise it does work. So we haven't had as much of that. So basically we are going from the conventional lecture theatre from medieval days to working. And my final word, I'm on my, but just don't, one second. Okay, traditional push works as well. 
This is from our course, which I teach, which is second year electromagnetism. And we run a thing called the BEMA test. And again, if you actually do traditional teaching, you get your students were blue was beforehand, red was after, and they all learn something. And again, even if you do the do completely traditional way. So again, I think we haven't analyzed this. We must do. In fact, I've got one of the PhD students is actually working on physics education and is going to do all the statistical analysis for this and actually test the two of them. But both work. But as I say, I think it's been a really interesting experiment. I went from 20 odd years of PowerPoint, absolutely traditional teaching, um, dropped myself into this voluntarily. Uh, and let's see, a little bit of adventure walking into the first lecture theatre with 300 students up there and you walking in with absolutely no plan of what was going to happen. But it did work. And interestingly, I now, when I'm walking through the cafe, I get the first year students saying hello to me. I walk around down, down George Square and they say, oh, oh, hello, how are you doing? I was in my local um, Marks and Spencers. And two of the students came up to me and said, ah, you're the physics lecturer, loved what you were doing. I think I'm quite happy with it. So I will stop there. I think we'll, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start stopping the moment. Most happy to answer any questions. <laughs>